Today I'm joined by the esteemed Richard Rawlings, who is considered one of the best UK estate agency coaches um, in the country. Richard, why don't estate agents represent buyers when in other countries, quite obviously, they do and earn quite well out? I know. In incredible, really, that we, we haven't. It's only half the story, really. I mean, representing sellers, it's what we've always done. But actually, representing buyers is something that's a bit of anathema to us. It's almost like they're the enemy um, because we're paid by the seller. Our job is to get the best price for the seller, do, do the best for the seller that we can. And we've never really seen the opportunity to represent buyers, where in other parts of the world, because their systems are different, um, it's a natural thing for them to represent buyers. Uh, over in the States, for example, you know, um, even though the seller pays the whole fee, the whole 6% fee, although that is going down, um, the, the, there's a buy side agent as well as a sell side agent. So the, the selling agent puts a stock on the multi-listing system, all the agents have access to it, and whoever sells it, the fee is split between them. But they do call themselves a buyer's agent. And we would say there's a conflict of interest there because the fee comes from the seller. Um, but I think that there is a huge opportunity that we've, we've completely missed. Um, to make an awful lot more money than we have been by formally representing buyers. Haven't things changed in America with regard to the way that's split? Yeah, absolutely. There's been a big legal case and uh, because the, the, the public are feeling seriously ripped off and uh, there's really been collusion um, and it's, it's gone on for too long. And frankly, I mean, I train agents to, to defend a really juicy fee, at least 2%, but I could not defend 6%. I think that's, it, it's unconscionable. I couldn't charge that. And so I think they, they are coming down. Um, how that will affect how, how the split between buyer and seller goes, I, I don't know. But because we don't have multi-listing here, it's meant that if a buyer registers with us, we can only sell them our own stock and that's it. And we wave goodbye to them. It seems an awful lot of work. I mean, what sort of return will we get from that work? Well, we have to look firstly at what we do initially, um, we, we, or we do uh, you know, with regular sellers. Uh, we spend a lot of time trying to get them on and then trying to sell the house, and it can take months. Representing buyers with my system that I've, I've sort of created by, by representation light, it's not what you expect. You don't have to go and find property for people. All you have to really do is help them buy. So it's really, uh, because if you think of it, most of the time we fail to sell, a regular agent will fail to sell to about 95% of their registered buyers. You only sell to 5%. The rest, they have to go and buy through somebody else. Half of them won't because they're time wasters, but the rest will buy through somebody else, even though they'd love to buy through us, but we just can't help them. We don't have the stock. So all I'm suggesting is we help those buyers, selected buyers that we identify, we help those buyers buy one of our competitors' properties. And this time we get a fee from it. I mean, the lowest hanging fruit is quite obviously your own vendors, isn't it? Because they've trusted you enough to sell their own house. Would you start there? Possibly, um, but uh, a, lot of, and a lot of agents would do this as a favour anyway. I'm talking about monetising it, but it's primarily for people who perhaps are not necessarily local to the area. The type of people you might offer this service to are maybe cash rich, time poor. They live from out of the area. They don't know the area. They don't want to schlep across the country every weekend, take their kids out of riding lessons or whatever to come and see these properties. Um, or they might want it to be quite discreet. I mean, the sort of people it appeals to are that, you know, it's originally been in the domain of the wealthy, but we're trying to bring it more high street now. Um, or it's an elderly person who is in danger of being abused, ripped off, doesn't understand the situation. Her, her son would help her buy, but he lives in Australia. So the sort of relationship I think we're talking about is um, a bit like a son, a daughter, uh, a, a brother. You know, if I wanted to, 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 to move to, to Manchester and my brother happened to live in Manchester, I don't want to slap there every weekend. I might say, Michael, do you know, I've seen this house online. What do you think? Hold on, you said earlier on it's not a case or it might not be a case of finding a property. Absolutely. That, my system of buy representation. And that's the difference between what you might expect a regular buyer representing agent to do. And where do they find their clients as well? You know, I mean, they, they've got to advertise for them. We've got a massive resource of, of buyers on our books as agents. We just have to identify those people that uh, we th think are suitable for the service and offer it to them and then help them buy one of our competitors' properties. So the, the two pools are your applicant database and potentially your vendors. 
I, yes, I mean, vendors na naturally you, you, you might, but don't forget they already probably know the area of the vendor as well. They're in the system of selling. I mean, but what, what I'm talking about is a mass market. You've only got so many sellers, you've got many, many more times buyers than sellers. Because you have taught an awful lot of estate agents, would you say the low hanging fruit are people who don't live in the area? coming into the area is that yeah. is that the low-hanging fruit Absolutely. for your i'd be identifying people who've got nowhere to sell or who are under pressure to move they're probably from out of the area they need a helping hand or they don't understand the system people from overseas very familiar with this system and they need help more than anyone else because they don't understand our, our rather archaic system so there's lots of people in there but on the basis that we only sell to about five percent of our buyers as it is all we have to do is identify and sell this service to 5% of the remainder, and we've pretty much doubled our fees. Okay, so how would you approach those sort of people, you know, assuming that our next know our database, which again, you know, it's a lot <laughs> that might not know, because they go into the CRM and they just get lost. But let's just assume you've, you've found probably 10 people that you think yeah, might work yeah. the service. How would you work that? Yeah, and, and that's interesting you said actually about the database, because this is really a natural progression of what a good negotiator does. They get to know their buyers quite well, they understand what they're looking for, but they're limited on what they can offer them. So they, 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 they would say to their, they'd identify whether the buyer's suitable. They shouldn't waste their time if they're not suitable, because that can lead to a lot of disappointment um, for the agent. Um, and they say, look, I, you know, I'm, I've shown you what, what I've got, um, unfortunately, we've kind of run out. Um, we can either wait until something comes on the books and I'll let you know, and that's what usually happens, but we've just introduced a new service whereby we can actually represent you, you know, and you know, we're getting on quite well and I feel I've got a good understanding of what you're after. You don't want to schlep over from Manchester every weekend. You know, let's work together. If you see something you like online, let me know. Or if I hear of something, or I can maybe go out and try and find something for you as well, um, then w could that service be of interest to you? And then would you actually... I mean, is there any money that, that, that changes hands before the, you know, the contract starts? I, I'm, <clears throat> traditionally, um, there's some sort of retainer, but I want to lower the barrier of entry. Um, this needs to be very easily accepted, up, taken up by exactly the right buyers who are keen. And bear in mind, a buyer is going to buy much faster than a seller will sell. Most of your buyers are going to find within a week or two of registering. Um, they, they need to see seven properties and you know, just show them seven. So seven. it's okay. How many do you think you actually have to find the property for versus... And no, it's not a case of versus versus um, actually just saying like being a voice saying, be careful, watch out for that. Yeah, I, and it's interesting. I mean, you could get deeply into it and go and find something. But in, in trying to find something for a buyer, um, you're going to find regular instructions as well. It's a brilliant way of bringing on regular instructions because you can now put a, a letter through a door and don't know whether they're on the market or not, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but let her through the, through the door and say, I genuinely have a buyer, Mrs. Mrs. Jones, you can give the name, doesn't matter, um, uh, who's interested in property just like yours, don't worry, there's no commission involved, they're paying my fees, would you be interested because you wouldn't have to pay any estate agency commission? Well, that, that gets you through a few doors. And if, for whatever reason, you've, that's a free value lead potentially for the next 6, 12, 18 months. Well, well from that point of view, if the buyer doesn't want to buy it, you've certainly okay. got someone who's interested who might come on in a regular course of events. This also probably requires agents to be more collaborative with their competitors. It's an interesting one. So let's say you have a retained, a tr retained client, a buyer, um, and they have told you they've seen a property on one of your competitors' books, um, and could you go and have a look at it for them maybe, or go around with them, or go and preview it? Um, so you phone that agent and you say, hello, Richard here from Rawlings Estates, um, I've got a retained buyer, um, I'd like to look at your property at six o'clock this evening, would that be okay? Now, in the normal course of events, most of the time, the agent gets it and they say, of course, that's fantastic, I'm dealing with a fellow professional, we both want to get a sale here, you're getting your fees from the buyer, I'm getting my fees from the seller in a regular way, come on round, absolutely. Now you might find one or two agents who say, well, I'm not fucking going up there for commissioning, piss off you. You can and steal my vendor. Yeah, absolutely. So in which case, you steal their vendor, <laughs> indirectly. There's nothing to stop you then from knocking on the door of that seller, because you, that agent has been negligent. They know someone, a buyer, that is so hot to trot, they've employed an agent to help them, and they're not letting them in. This is weird, they shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> Knock on the door, hello, Mr. Seller. Richard here, no fees involved. Um, I tried to get my retained client uh, to look at your, they want to look at your property. I tried to get them through through your agent this morning, but they wouldn't let us round. 
And this has uh, got some interesting things going on now with the seller and that agent's relationship, because that agent's been negligent, and you're in quite a good position then to pick, on that, pick up that instruction down the line. But that's an, an indirect benefit. I mean, okay. ideally, you work with other agents. I mean, you wouldn't blame the other agent to actually say, well, I'll do it a company viewing. So they, Absolutely. And they, they're which most welcome to do so. Both sides have representation. They might say, oh, well, who's your, who's your buyer? And so it's Mrs. Jones and from this address. I'm not hiding anything. Mrs. Jones is, uh, I've got a letter of authority from her saying she's, she's formally represent, being represented, his sole agency contract, which is just like a, a regular sole agency contract on the other side. And this whole thing's a bit like, instead of folding your arms like that, it's folding your arms like that. It's a bit weird, but it's the same thing. And so that agent should be delighted that you've got somebody um, to, to look at that. Especially when the market has been hardening over the last few months. Yeah. Um, I mean, That's an interesting point on both markets, actually. If it's a, a seller's market and there's nothing available, the buyers love the fact you might be able to give them access to properties not yet on the market. And if it's a, a buyer's market, when there's lots available, they need someone to nip and tuck and sift and negotiate. Your negotiation skills really come in here. Because that's how you're going to charge. How much can you charge? Ordinarily, and I've seen a, a number of uh, buyer, buyers agents who, who charge a fortune, uh, retainers of two, three, five thousand pounds a month, even at the higher level, we're bringing this high street, low barrier of entry, there's no retainer. And don't forget, that's fine because you're not really doing an awful lot of additional work as such. Um, I'm, my, my system charges 20 or even 25 percent of the saving you make between the asking price and the price you negotiate with a minimum of 1%, because your good advice might be, no, pay the asking price, pay over the asking price. And in that event, your 1% kicks in. But generally speaking, the saving, and in, in a market where it is more of a buyer's market, perhaps, that can amount to quite a lot. You'll make as much on the, this instruction okay. as you'll make on a regular seller instruction, and faster too. Okay, so I mean, you have this system. I'm assuming that, I mean, agents watching this could go and sort it themselves, but you almost have a plug and play system, I'm assuming, here with here's some marketing, here's, here's an agreement. You, you know. need a, quite a bit of legal documentation. I mean, you need a formal um, sole agency agreement. I also have um, uh, an offer document that's all been passed by solicitors because I want to empower my buyer client that when it comes to making an offer, it's not just some offer over the phone as usual. Here is an offer document, and it's, it's binding. It's binding on, on the buyer, with some caveats for the seller as well. Um, and we've got yeah, loads of all sorts of other uh, documentation that goes with it in terms of your you know, communications and Okay, I mean, the purpose of this video is just to highlight the idea, but if an agent wants to contact you and find out a bit more about this system that you, that you yeah. have, how do they contact you, Richard? Richard at Rawlings.info. And in fact, there is information about it at Rawlings.info as well. Um, and so, so yeah, that, that, that's why. But yeah, as I say, they could do it themselves, but I think it does require a bit of, well, I have a whole half day training course because they do need to get a few things. There's a lot say, more it to just meet the eye. It's not a case yeah. of just having some documents. It must be mindset. It, it is. It really is. And there are a lot of spin-offs on this as well. We haven't covered this. There's a lot more to this than, than meets the eye. A lot well, of questions. Okay. okay, so just quickly, you've got about 90 mm. seconds. What, what other things have you got? Uh, for by representation, yeah, go for it. Well, I think it, it's, it's an understanding. For example, there'll be agents who want to go and advertise this service. And I would say, don't do that because that'll confuse your sellers. Who do you represent? You don't need to advertise it. Advertising is to pull in clients. You've got a database of 500 potential clients. Yeah. Dip into that. See, I would have, I, you would have thought, just advertise it. Yeah. No. We've got a whole list, for example, of, of dialogues of, of sort of FAQs and things, objections, all the objections that okay. people might have. Oh, you know, what, why should I, why should I pay the 1% if, if you don't get me something off the asking price or, or whatever, and ways of dealing with those competitors as well, uh, and template letters for people not yet on the market, which is really useful. And there's all sorts of conflicts of interest that people might think about that we have to deal with, um, and so we cover all that, knowing how to deal with conflict of Excellent. interest. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've known Richard for over 10 years, and he is truly exceptional. He's a man that I look up to in the industry, so do, please do check him out. Thank you for your time today, Richard. Thank you, Chris.